my name's Richard Moore. I'm the owner and founder of Digital Media Edge, and I also run Ignite Growth as a separate consultancy business, um, working on growth strategy with businesses, uh, very hands-on working, helping them digitally transform, um, and just really to benefit their end-to-end -end business growth from planning out the strategy to delivering it. That's through driving the right traffic, through converting that traffic into leads in their database or the CRM, nurturing those leads and then working on the sales process to ensure that they have a predictable conversion um, of these leads into customers and revenue for their business. So generally, I work on Ignite Growth strategically and then DME is very much delivery. So we support clients, uh, support businesses to actually execute their strategies and make sure that they achieve their revenue growth goals every 12 months. So we're very much based around what do you want to achieve revenue wise in the next 12 months and then breaking that down into how many customers you need, how many leads that translates into what traffic we can drive to generate that number of leads. So today is very much focused on lead gen. So hopefully, um, We've all gone through it the last 12 months. So this is very, very pertinent to most people is to kickstart this growth again as quickly as possible. Um, I've looked through, I mean, there were 15 odd people that had signed up for today. So I was looking through some of your businesses and there's a good diversity in there uh, from graphic design, uh, travel specialists. Um, we've got uh, consultancies, um, waste, uh, we've got a lot of you seem to be in the B2B sector uh, with a couple in the B2C sectors. So uh, our expertise is definitely B2B, although we do have some B2C clients. Um, we really do focus on uh, what's a very predictable market is B2B because usually you're working within quite tight sectors and verticals and um, have a quite clearly defined ideal customer profile um, and buyer personas that you're trying to get your message in front of. So today I'll talk through the different ways that we've seen working for our clients over the past, probably the past year. Um, a lot of things that used to work pre-COVID have stopped working um, just because of the lack of face-to-face, -face, um, the lack of the interaction that we're having, actually having face-to-face -face meetings, you know, the inability to have trade shows. Um, a lot of these things have obviously even live networking, I suppose, has been affected a lot. So it has affected the way people generate their leads. So what I've written in this workshop for the next two hours is really how we address that um, in the current environment and how you kickstart your lead generation going forward as well. So a little bit about me. Um, I was uh, head of marketing for a large law firm for eight years in Lincolnshire um, and across the East Midlands. Um, originally born in Yorkshire, I was born in Otley, lived in Harrogate and Leeds uh, for a long time and then moved down to Lincolnshire, uh, came head of marketing for a law firm. Uh, in the last recession, they were cutting back on the marketing team. So I took redundancy and set my own business up. Um, and then Digital Media Edge really came out of that business in 2015. We were having a lot of clients uh, around Lincolnshire ask us to help them grow their businesses. So we really position ourselves as a growth marketing agency. We don't really regard ourselves as a marketing agency or a design agency. Um, we are really focused at DME on helping businesses grow. And that's what we've done over the last five years. Um, we're also a HubSpot Gold partner, so we be, used HubSpot ourselves for six months and then realized that it was just the best platform out there we felt for end-to-end -end business growth and measuring that growth, so having metrics at every stage of our growth. Uh, so we actually became a partner with HubSpot. We can do HubSpot onboarding now. We can help people use the system and the platform properly. Um, and also, as I say, we, um, uh, we do believe it's just the best system out there. It replaced 13 pieces of software with one when we uh, took it on uh, ourselves two and a half years ago. Uh, very much strategy first is our, uh, is our philosophy. Um, we see a lot of businesses out there go very tactical so they maybe think oh how am I going to drive traffic how am I going to use Facebook how am I? it's very tactic based rather than mapping out their strategy and um, looking at their marketplace how they position their offers uh, in front of uh, their buyers and then how to drive the correct traffic and really focus their time on on good fit leads because people are generating all sorts of leads and what we're trying to do today is identify who's a good fit lead for our business and how do we get in front of more of those and attract more of those to our business so we're not wasting that 50 percent of our time where we're speaking to someone who's never going to become a client you know there's there's often um businesses spend so so much of their time and certainly sales teams but 
it, it's more, I think we're more guilty of it when we're single founders and owners of businesses that we try and speak to everybody we can ab out of about our business, uh, rather than identifying who's going to benefit the most, who we've enjoyed working with in the past, looking at our existing client base and saying, this was a, this is a really good fit for what we do. So that's uh, one of our beliefs is that you plan out a strategy to attract good fit leads into your CRM, and then you nurture your relationships with those leads, build trust and authority um, until there's that natural sales conversation about how you can help them. Um, over the years, we've dealt with huge corporates, national corporates, um, and we've also dealt with small SMEs. We've really got every size of business we've dealt with. Uh, I think our sectors that we specialize in would always be B2B, um, very much tech sector, uh, cybersecurity companies, uh, SaaS companies, uh, other design agencies, other, other agencies. We've onboarded a number of other marketing agencies actually onto HubSpot and help them grow, which may seem a bit uh, a bit like it's uh, helping our competition, but we just feel that there's plenty of businesses out there that need help. So um, we will help anybody really just uh, to make sure that they're growing their business. Um, and then I set up Ignite Growth uh, two years ago now uh, with my wife. She was doing um, consultancy work for the DFE, the Department for Education, um, and uh, across Lincolnshire helping schools. And I was being asked to do more and more sort of project management work and non-exec director work and actually going in for days with businesses where I'd spend the day with them and help them get the growth strategy right. So goals over this two hours, um, really to map out the buyer's journey is one of my first starting points. Um, I did have another workshop uh, set up to do uh, with you guys, which was going to go through buyer personas in depth and how we develop out a buyer persona and who is that good fit buyer. Uh, an ideal customer profile, which would be the company or the sector that we're targeting, and then the people who work within those companies that we need to be in front of. Um, and that naturally leads on to what's the journey they go on when they make a buying decision. So I'll be picking up from there um, where I would have finished there, but I will discuss a little bit about that um, because we haven't gone through that workshop, which would naturally lead into this. Um, during that buyer's journey, we're trying to identify what questions these buyers are asking as they progress from stage to stage in making a buying decision. Um, so we all do our own research now. We go online, we're on our iPads, we're on our mobile phones, we're on our computers, just doing research into any problem or pain we have, you know, and we ask a varying number of questions as we go through making a buying decision. Um, so I'll go through identifying those questions for your own businesses. So what are the questions that your buyers are asking as they have a problem that you can help them with? And how can you then uh, address that question, answer that question in solution driven content, and then make sure that as many of those good fit buyers are seeing that content as possible. Um, understanding the importance of business positioning. Again, this is a massive one that people make such a big mistake with. They try and position everything they do in front of everybody out there, rather than saying, I'm really good at this for this person. This is the per person I can help. And this is the position, the business positioning that I'm going to take. So your business should be talking really to one buyer persona or one sector and saying how you can help them achieve one thing. You know, if you can get it as clear as that, you will grow because you'll have very, very clearly defined messaging, all your copy will reflect that, and the people that you attract to you will always be those good fit people. So that's all done by positioning your business correctly. How to be a magnet to good fit buyers. Again, I've just touched on it there, but that's really showing that you are the expert that they need to be speaking to, or at least be in their consideration when they're looking at two or three options to solve their problem or uh, be a, solve a challenge that they're facing or a pain point they're going through, you need to naturally be in that mix of, you know, I must include in my consideration when I'm looking at the solutions. Then I'm going to go through a bit of inbound marketing. Um, we're very much not outbound at all. We think inbound is the only way to really get these good quality leads coming through because they're showing intent to consume your content they're coming through looking at watching your videos and inbound is that person who's coming back and showing that they already are aware of your business so again we're not cold calling we're not trying to generate a lead out of nothing we're just focusing on what's the content i need to get out there 
to attract these and pull these people back through my website? And then how do I offer them something of value to convert them into a lead in my, in my CRM or database? So very much inbound marketing strategy. I'll go through the different steps that we use with clients when we're setting up an inbound strategy for them. Uh, and that should give you a really good basis for your own strategies as well. Uh, the power of content, obviously content is everything to us um, in Inbound because we're answering people's questions with good blog posts, we're answering questions through video, we're answering questions through social media posts, all of this is then pulling people back through the website and we can then connect and engage with them. How to use social media, obviously if you're in B2B, LinkedIn will probably be a platform you'll focus on, B2C, Facebook maybe, you maybe use a lot of video content in your business. And um, certainly if you're in graphic design, you maybe use uh, Instagram, very visual format, but there'll be a platform not for you, but for your buyer. Where's your buyer? What's that buyer persona? Where's their trusted resource that they would go to? And what's their trusted social media platform that they go to? So again, using that the right platform to amplify your reach and make sure you're in front of these people regularly is really key because we want to stay front of mind. Um, that's the whole thing with digital is you can be front of mind for a few seconds and then disappear and they never think of you again. Or you can be constantly front of mind because you're just sharing valuable, useful content with them and helping them move from stage to stage as they make a decision. And then finally, I'll touch on at the end, optimizing your website for conversions. Um, again, it's the first thing we start with any client is we'll analyze their Google Analytics for what website traffic are they getting now? What have they already got coming through the website? And are they converting at a minimum of 2% of traffic every month into a lead in their CRM? So have that as your benchmark. Am I converting at 2%? You know, if you're getting 600 leads a month is 2% of 600 visitors a month to your website is 2% of that turning into a lead in your database. And most companies we'd speak to or we analyze, it'll be 0.1% if they're lucky. So again, that, have that as a benchmark in your mind. If you can get to that level reliably of conversion, I'll show you ways to do that. Um, then everything else from there follows, doesn't it? Because if you can convert traffic into into leads in your CRM, then you know you need X amount of leads to get so many customers. So maybe one in four leads turns into a customer. Then you've started to have figures to optimize your whole growth process. So does that make sense? Anyone put yes in chat? So I know chat's working because I have got it up here. Simon, that's a why. That's nearly a yes, Simon. <laughs> yes, yes. Please post messages here, yeah. Okay, so you're all using chat. So any questions you've got as we go through, um, feel free just to post them up in chat. Um, if I don't see them, Rachel will pick them up. Um, and uh, as I say, that's the best way is to ask the questions as we go along. Uh, if it's really important question that I think uh, everyone's gonna benefit from, then I'll probably bring you off mute and we'll talk it through. Um, there is a Q&A session at the end as well, so. If you don't want to ask it live, then we can ask it at the end. So let's move. Um, so each of you, as I say, in chat, can you just type in, um, let's, let's pick one of the questions to answer here, what your growth goals are. Um, if you can type in chat what your growth goals are for the next 12 months. And I mean, some of you may be just setting your businesses up and you've got quite, um, uh, but I want a figure here of uh, actual revenue put in a revenue figure of what you want to be generating from your business revenue wise by this time next year. So January 2022, what do you want to be generating from your business? Anybody? Is any gonna, anybody gonna put it in? <laughs> Come on, Janie, you start the, start the ball rolling. <laughs> 50K, 50,000, 35K, good. Okay, Janie, and where are you now? Zero. Oh, so we're going zero to 50K, right? So that's 12 months. Okay, that's good. Ollie, grow from three sites to four or five, generating 1.2 to 1.5 million. Excellent. So you've got three sites at the moment, have you, Ollie? Yeah, where are they based? Are they all around? Let's see, where's your uh, details? So that's the Escapologist, is it? Yeah, and what are they? Are they um, are they bars? Are you Houdini? Do you 
hang people over a river and escape from chains? I don't know. 700k, uh, Selby, Leeds and Wakefield, bars, restaurants and escape rooms. I'll, ah, the escape I like that, really nice, yeah. Good idea. Um, so you've got a venue in Selby, Leeds and Wakefield, obviously at the moment, are they all closed at the moment? Um, you've no way of operating those, I suppose, no. Um, so we're looking really towards uh, April time, May time, and things should be starting to get back to normal for you. And have you identified those other two sites, Ollie? Uh, yeah, we've um, I've got four in a short list. One was supposed to be opening, um, well, taking the keys April this year, but obviously it's been delayed somewhat. So that's the the Manchester site in Arndale. Manchester, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's probably going to be August now, hopefully. Real. Okay. Fab. Anyone else? Kevin wants to be a billionaire. That's good. Is that is that a, a specific figure, Kevin? How many billion? Are you going to be the Trump? <laughs> I'm just new to this sales like, so I'm uh, I'm not setting any kind of goal yet. All right. Well, get a, get a figure in your mind, mate. As I say, even if you don't want to say it out loud, I'd, I'd get yourself a, a, a solid turnover figure and write it somewhere. Uh, it'll just allow you then to reverse engineer what, what you need to generate customers, clients wise. Um, what's your business, Kevin? I sell refuse bins and waste services. Your way. See, are you based in York? Are you? Uh, North Yorkshire, really. Our head office is North Allerton. Ah, we right. A, yeah, yeah. We have a base in Thirsk, York, Scarborough, Whitby, uh, nice. Pancred, which is up near Catterick. So, yeah, it's all North Yorkshire. So, what's your what's your business size at the moment? How many people have you got working for you? Uh, it's about three hundred. Three hundred. Um, yeah, about 300 people. A lot of that's drivers and service delivery. And um, you're an area development manager, are you? Or an, an yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Now, I, I was a driver. You just previous. joined them. I've been there uh, three years in September, so two and a bit. Um, and what's and your I'm, area then? I'm East Coast. East Coast. Yeah, but I'm based in New York, so it's a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult. And do they give you targets then? They must give you targets. Yeah, I'm, I'm, they? I'm, my uh, monthly is, is 25. Yeah. Um, and, and have they given you scope to become a billionaire then, Kevin? I don't think I'd be a billionaire even if I was an MD. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you have a, got a target anyway. You've got a, you've got a figure yeah, and a yeah, financial a figure in your mind that you need to hit. Yeah, cool. I just want to get a target right. for, for, to get me a probation. Yeah, yeah. Well, get your get your target figure in mind. Write that down, and then break that down in customers you need to generate. Yeah, yeah. Are they quite actively digital? Are they digitally active? Um, what your waste or my customers? Yeah, are your waste is your is your business themselves? Yeah. Are they quite good at lead generation, yeah, just, or do you generate yeah, your own leads? We've just got a CRM now that's uh, not really fit for purpose, but um, yeah. It's supposed to be an e-sign, but we still have to go and get the direct debit because the e-sign doesn't work with the direct debit. So, so I don't know why. So yeah. we're a little bit, we're getting it's there. So they're lurching into digital transformation bit yeah. by bit. It's a work in progress. A work. <laughs> All right, mate. Well, as I say, um, you've got some financial targets, which is good. Um, yeah. Certainly, uh, how do you generate leads at the moment then, Kevin? What would your approach to generating a new lead be? It's uh, mainly it'll be cold calling or sort of campaign, leaflet campaign, followed up with with a, a warm call, that sort of thing. So, so it's pretty broadcasty. Yeah, sort of I mean, telling I, everyone about what you do and hoping a few people come back. Yeah, yeah. effectively. I wanted to be out walking the uh, industrial estates, but unfortunately with COVID and that. No, no. We, yeah, that's exactly weird. why. So, you need other other lead gen opportunities as well. That's going to bring inbound yeah. leads coming in as well as your old cold calling and outbound. Um, so I'll, hopefully some of what I talk about today, you'll be able to take back to the bosses as well. Yeah, because awesome. um, I think this will help you. Really good lead gen to me is feeding the right leads to your sales team. So making sure you've got a criteria of what a good lead looks like to, for your sales team. 
and we generate those leads as marketers. So as a marketing side and the lead gen side, we generate those leads, but we have a very much a sales enablement role in marketing now as well. So we're not just generating the lead, handing it to sales and then sales telling us that's a crap lead. You know, we're basically working with sales and we have regular sales meetings where we talk things through with the sales team and say, right, what are you hearing on the front line? You know, what are the questions people are asking you? Can we produce content to answer that? Um, and that's really the whole mentality for lead gen now has shifted an awful lot from marketing doing the lead gen and then sales picking the lead up to it being a, a revenue based across with these are our revenue goals for the year. This is what marketing's got to contribute to that revenue goal. And this is what sales should be contributing as well as in converting those leads. And the better quality a lead is that you're giving to sales, you know that the conversion rate is just going to go up and up and up as well because that person showed an interest, they've got a real need for what you do. Um, and a lot of that pre-qualifying that we used to do just through questioning can be done through content as well. So again, what I'm gonna share with you today will really help all of you. I'm sure if you're in B2B like Kevin is, talking to other businesses, um, but again, like, um, Ollie was that's a very much a B2C you're marketing to to consumers you're trying to get people using the restaurants the bars the escape rooms uh, again all of these principles can be used across the board I haven't really focused on B2B much in this <coughs> so I talked about knowing who our primary buyer is um, Again, when it's Ollie, he'll, he'll have a section of society who he knows this is who we're targeting. These are the people that use us the most. This is their demographics. This is their age. This is their gender. Um, you know, you'll probably appeal to multiple people. But if I went through your customer list and people who visited your premises uh, or clients that people have had if they're in B2B, I know that there'll always be one that will stand out head, of, head and shoulders above everybody else. They're the people who've really used you, who your service fits the best. As I say, there'll always be two or three sub uh, subcategories as well, but I'd always say, let's get, make sure that we're well positioned in front of that primary buyer first, make sure we're answering their questions. We know exactly the buyer's journey they go through when they're looking for a venue, for an escape room, things like that. What questions are they asking? What event triggers them to look for this? So that's really important, that primary buyer knowledge. And again, I haven't got much time to cover that in this workshop, but it's something I do in the strategy workshop that I was due to do. Um, I do that in real detail because it isn't a one-off job. And a lot of people think, oh, well, I've got primary buyer. I've got buyer personas. People talk to me to death about buyer personas. But what they don't do is they do the work once and then they don't mature them. They don't interview their existing customers and say, you know, does that fit that buyer persona or is our buyer persona now, now shifting? You know, you need to understand that person inside out. What social media do they use? What do they post on? What content do they consume? What videos do they watch? You know, all of these things are really important that you have that understanding. So everything you're doing is telling your story, but in the format that they want to consume it in. So again, mapping out their buyer's journey is the next step. Um, we simplify the buyer's journey into three stages that we all go through when we make a buying decision. Um, there's actually, I think I've got a book that I've, I'm reading at the moment where there's 12 stages he identifies, lots of small stages. Um, I like to keep it simple to start with to make sure that we're aligning how we market and sell with how a buyer actually buys our service or buys our, our product. So the first stage is very much an awareness stage. So think of the last time you bought a product, you went out there and you probably, there was something that triggered you to start doing some research. You know, it's either a pain, it's an opportunity, it's I need a new pair of running shoes, it's whatever, something has asked, something triggers something in your mind. So what we start doing is some general awareness research. So we're out there, and we're asking very general educational questions because we're trying to understand and frame that problem that we've got. So we're really trying to give it a name to understand the problem. So I say the first stage that we all go through is this defining stage, asking general questions to understand the pain or challenge that's in front of us. So very much marketers don't market there very well at the moment um, and companies generally don't market very well there but it's a massive opportunity for all of you to start thinking what are the general people questions that people ask or what's the things that they start to do in that general education research phase that I can position a video in front of them or I can write a blog post about and again it's all question based I'd say just go through all your questions and say 
well, that's a pretty general question. That's quite a specific question. That's how we do it with a client. Because then when we've got framed our problem or framed what we're looking for, we then go through this consideration stage. So now we've clearly defined our problem and named it, we start doing far more specific research. So the searches we do on Google, the searches we do in YouTube, the questions we ask on social media are far more specific and very much detail driven here. So we can understand the methods, the approaches, the options that we have. And that in that consideration stage, is when we, you know, when we always say to our clients, you know, have a checklist in there, have something that people can download and tick off as they're going through it, certainly in B2B scenarios. But again, in consideration stage for B2C customers, you know, people really in the consideration stage is when they're trying to shortlist the two or three companies that they're going to pick the phone up to or send an email to or make an inquiry to. Um, so in consideration stage, what content can you get in front of people there? And then that's all leading us through to that decision stage. So when we start to have all the information in front of us and we're happy with the decision we're making, and remember what you're trying to do is help them make the right decision for them. It might not be the right decision for you as a business, but as long as you're giving them value all the way along, you're increasing your odds of you being the business that they choose at the end of it. So again, decision-making stage is that selection, right? I understand what the problem is, I now understand all the options to solve that problem, and this is who I'm going to choose to help me solve that problem. So this is the product, this is the service, this is the, the company that I'm going to choose. And again, that's where your content needs to be reviews, it needs to be case studies, testimonials, all of these things underline our decision. So it's very important that you align your content with these three stages. Does that make sense? Everyone in chat, does that make sense to you? Any questions about that? No, nothing coming up yet. Cool. Yeah, excellent. Um, I'm going to go through how my wife bought her little mini um, because that's how we did it. it this, this buying journey can go on for either a couple of minutes, like when you're buying on Amazon, you go through that whole process, that decision-making process very quickly. Um, if you're buying a set of product, because you more or less know what you want, you're just going through reviews and you're sort of shortlisting, doing your consideration stage and then going through. Something that's more expensive, we spend more time in that uh, buyer's journey that we're on. So with my wife, Jackie, when she bought her car, we went through this over three and a half, four months this took. Uh, so initially doing a search, we knew we, the car's coming to the end of its lease. We wanted a new car. So we started doing a few searches generally about cars. We were just looking for a small car for it to have as our second car for the family. Um, Jackie was chatting to her friends on, on Facebook, she was talking to all the teacher friends about the cars they drive, what they like. I'm doing the man thing and going on YouTube and watching all of the car wow videos and uh, becoming the expert on every little car I can find. Um, and this went on for months. And then eventually we decided one Saturday, right, we'll go get a short list. We've done our consideration. We know what we're looking for. And we got a short list of seven or eight different car dealers around Lincoln. And off we went um, around all the car dealers, having the worst buying experience I've ever had in my life, to be honest. Car dealers are the worst. I don't know if you've, any of you have been through it, but it was literally Renault Capture. No, we haven't got this the new model in stock yet, so you couldn't go for a test drive. We went to VW for a T-Rock test drive. No, you couldn't have a T-Rock because Billy from bloody servicing's taking it to centre parks with his family. You know, it was literally garage after garage like that. And I'm just, just shaking my head. So eventually we got to the bottom of Lincoln and there was Sayat, I think it was Sayat we went in last and this scruffy guy in a really scruffy suit comes up, wouldn't even give us a brochure, just wanted, uh, wanted our name, email address and said, I'll email you a brochure. Wouldn't let us book a test drive there and then. So we walked out pretty despondent. Um, and then we were going to McDonald's for a coffee opposite and there's a mini, mini garage behind. So my wife lo loved her mini when she was growing up. So she said, oh, let's go and have a look at mini. And I thought, oh, it's not really in our budget, but we'll go in. Met this really nice chap called Nigel. He just said, look, we've got a 48 hour test drive. Why don't you take one for two days? If you like it, then we can talk price when you come back. So straight away, rather than sell to us, he just got Jackie to have it. And we both loved it. Had this little red mini Cooper, absolutely loved it. And um, I went back on the back on the internet, finding the best lease deals. Got it, I think it was about 200 and 
20 pounds i think i got it for um from a, a lease company in manchester uh, so i went back to nigel said look i want to stay local nigel what can we do and he came in about 280 i said ah oh, no i says you know it's too much of a difference so we worked through the options worked our way down and basically got it to 224 in the end um stayed local bought the car off him and uh, that was our whole buyer's journey Every, nearly all of it was online. Mini hadn't come up once in the search. So I did feedback to how crap their marketing was because uh, I said, you didn't come up once. It was look, pure serendipity that we were going for a coffee at McDonald's opposite you. The reason we walked through that showroom that day. So his lead gen was actually pretty poor. Um, but what he did really well was the sales side um, made us really feel like he valued what we, what we wanted and um, because it was compared to those previous seven experiences we had it just stood head and shoulders above so again his problem there was lead gen he hadn't got involved in our early searches he should have been popping up when we were doing our google searches they didn't have any content at all not even video content i tried to look for some video content on minis and there was literally one or two videos on mini i said you know you know everything about minis nigel why aren't you doing video content you know that would have helped us make a decision and brought us to you far earlier so again that's just if you think about any product you purchase, any service, this is just the same as if you're looking for a, an accountant or you're looking for a, a HR company. You know, you, we go through this same process of doing our own research. And then when we're 70% of the way through, then a, we may pick up a phone, we may email somebody, we may engage with somebody there. So keep that in mind all the time that people aren't picking the phone up to you now. They're, they're doing all their own research and you need to get involved in that research as early as you can. So thinking it through, what questions are your buyers asking? I've already talked about this. At what stage of their journey are they when they ask them? So if it's a quite a general question, we know we're just, they're just starting their buying journey. If it's getting quite specific, you know, so if I'm asking now about the colours of a Mini, that's a very specific question compared to my small car search. You know, what small cars um, are available? You know, what are the best small cars? You know, that's very general searching. Then I'm getting into a Mini and colours of Mini. You know, that's very specific. Uh, so we're starting to ask questions. So again, Ollie, yours, your questions are going to be around what can we do next weekend? You know, what can we do for our birthday? What can we do for an event? Um, but then they're going to be talking about restaurants, bars, escape rooms. You know, they're going to get in real specific questions about what they want to do. You want to be speaking to people in that second sector. You want to attract them though and engage with them and connect with them very early on in that. So you need content at the front end and then you need content at each stage of that to pull them through that and just have them talking to you. Uh, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to choose you, but you want to be positioned in front of them in that way. And where are they asking them? So again, don't waste time on platforms where you're trying to cover every social media platform. Find out where your buyers spend most of their time and where are their trusted resources for finding things out. So what social channels are they using? Is there any... Um, blogs they go to is there any different ways uh, you know especially in b2b there's a lot of industry sites there's a lot of groups people belong to things like that so if they're on linkedin are there any linkedin groups for those people and where are they asking these questions so you can be responding to them and providing them content and giving them value early on is that making sense to everybody Yes, yes. Does anyone do this at the moment in their business? Anyone, anyone of you have a buyer persona that you work on and you know where they are and what questions they're asking? Anyone? Okay. They say it's fundamental is this, but it's really important you start thinking like this. It's called buyer centric thinking rather than thinking of us as businesses and broadcasting our message out to as many people as possible. We're getting into the mindset of our buyer and our best buyer, our primary buyer. As I say, there'll be other buyers as well that you can appeal to in the future, build marketing campaigns out for multiple people. But in this, you're trying to get your lead gen going. So they're good fit leads. This is the best person I help. You know, it may be 
parents who want to have an escape room for children for their teenage kids it may be that you identify corporate work is a really good source for you ollie um, again, it, you know, there's all these different markets you can look at, but look at your spreadsheet, look at your revenue, where's it being generated now? Um, and there'll be someone will stand out. I can guarantee it. Whenever I look at anyone's database or CRM, there's someone always stands out as their primary buyer um, and a specific industry in B2B, a specific sector and industry that they do really well. They may still be marketing at every other industry, but that's the one they should be focusing on. So take this on board and just write those questions down. What questions are the buyers asking? At what stage of their buyer's journey are they asking them and where are they asking them? So are they typing them into Google? Are they on YouTube looking for videos? Are they in groups, as I say, on LinkedIn? Just identify where they're most likely to ask those questions. Uh, I've, we're not doing this activity today uh, in this workshop, but I will ask Michelle to send across um, a blank version of this so you can use use this as well uh, to help you, which is where you're just writing down the questions in each of these boxes that people are asking at each stage. Um, so again, I'll set, make sure you get sent that across. It's uh, a PDF that we can send over to you. So then we know who we're targeting what their journey is when they're making a decision. So now how do we position our business in front of them? And I said this at the start, that this is the biggest mistake I see most businesses make is that it's trying to position themselves to appeal to everybody with every service that they do, rather than positioning one service as a primary offering to get people involved with them and then cross sell and upsell into the other, into the other services that they have. Because you've built a relationship, people love you by then, they enjoy working with you. So it's perfect time then to talk to them about the other things you do but you've got to identify that business positioning for the initial relationship you want people to know you for so the six steps that we follow when we're assessing how to write a strong business positioning statement because we'd have it really in a paragraph we'll what we're trying to aim for here is a paragraph so assess our current positioning so what's the unique value pro proposition that you offer so how do you solve challenges and help your buyer buyer realize their goals better than the competition do so you know why are you better than the competition it's that differentiation that we're all trying to say, um, find for our business it's this is why we're different to everybody else out there and then define your why so why you set your business up why you go to work every day um, why would clients or buyers want to work with you and what are the problems that you solve so defining your why is very important um, identifying your best customer and the client so the who is really important again so you're differentiating yourself and saying this is who we look after the best so identifying a specific vertical an industry or a specific audience that you help the best um, identifying core competencies so that's what you do uh, what you're already experts in why you're a thought leader in certain areas and defining your company culture again i think that telling a company story is really important because people do connect emotionally with companies who have a really strong company culture and um, so it's a way of life in your business your values your belief and um, your behaviors everything that guides your decision so defining these out is really important and then you should come up with a paragraph that sums up all of those bits so it's something that's really important here because that's going to be it's be, it's more than a mission statement it's really should be on every piece of marketing content that goes out there or elements of it so people understand straight away when they see your business who you can help how you can help it how you can help them and why you're the best and they need to consider using you And again, we've got that primary buyer persona in mind when we're writing this. And um, so clear positioning is to provide that focus on who you work with, what products and services you offer and how you do it. And um, not trying to market to everyone, which is, as I say, the biggest weakness I see most businesses have is they are trying to have this broad stroke approach rather than being laser targeted and then having another campaign that's targeted at another sector and a buyer persona and another one and um, building on it layer by layer rather than trying to do everything at once. So I've said here that good business positioning is going to give you that direction and um, there's no question about what you do or who you do it for or how you do it. It's really clearly um, clearly defined as the direction of your business. Um, strong 
or at positioning for your target audience as well because it's aimed straight and the language that you use is aimed at that buyer persona. It also allows you to have this really efficient sales process. So what I was talking about earlier was providing a good fit lead and prospect and making sure that that's all the, the only people that your sales team or yourself are talking to are those people because we've got the right content in front of them. Um, and it'll also improve that customer experience. So what I was talking about with BMW and with Mini was the customer experience. You know, our customer experience with them compared to everybody else out there was just streets ahead. And I know they've developed that and they've thought that through, but actually it was the person that delivered it. You know, if that had been someone else, he may not have delivered that in the same way. So again, back to company culture. Um, so this is a DME, this is our DME one that we wrote um, a few years ago now. We wrote this as our business positioning statement, but you can see what I mean. It's just a paragraph that says, we drive increased leads and revenue growth for owners of medium-sized businesses in Lincolnshire. So again, we geographically targeted that our core area was going to be Lincolnshire, because again, through our own research, we thought that's who our best fit companies are. Yeah, we work with people all over, all over the country, but actually our best fit people are the people we can go meet face to face in Lincolnshire. So planning, executing, optimizing a measurable digital marketing strategy and sales strategy, because we genuinely value their success and believe predictable lead and revenue growth is pivotal to overcoming challenges and achieving your business growth goals. So that was sort of our business positioning statement you know anyone who reads that doesn't have any doubt about who we look after how we look after them and why we believe we're the best to do it so does that make sense yeah okay and what was that you were saying? Ollie, can you just come off mute and explain about your multiple team building and birthdays? Is that your targeting? Yeah. Is that what you were saying? In terms of our targeted marketing, it's we kind of go through phases where we kind of refocus, go problem solution, um, break it down. Obviously, we've got a strong team building B2B side, but yeah. um, and then a lot of the other stuff's kind of social or just you know, yeah. plugging a gap for birthday parties, you know, yeah. cocktail making with an escape room in a Harry Potter theme. Um, yeah, yeah. very easy to fall into a really vague oh this is what we do and it, and it's not focused to the to the customer. yeah 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 and I think the relationships you build you see people come back to you time and time again I mean the thing with your business is once you get that loyalty you know and that referral network that those people oh, I went to escape room you know the what's it called the escapologist yeah I went to the escapologist what great time we had you know you want that story being told and you want to enable them to tell that story to all the friends don't you so no. you know if you if you focus on being really good at a few of those sectors you'll get more of that end referral than you would if you're trying to be really broad because someone who went on a Harry Potter day isn't going to it isn't going to recommend it for a team building to his boss at work is he so you see no. what I mean by positioning yourself a lot clearer in people's minds about what they get and um, but your experience itself will position it for you as well so no absolutely you know, but I, I would still say if you look through your revenue that's generated you'll have a standout this is where we generate our best revenue you know like you're saying the rest are just filling gaps really the other campaigns you're running Does that make sense mate yeah, absolutely. Good. So again, clear business positioning doesn't mean we don't offer other services to other people down the line. But my view is very much get yourself a core offering um, that's your primary offer and then build out to other offers that you cross sell and upsell over time. Um, and again, generating referrals, generating reviews, all of these things are all done from having a happy customer that you've looked after and, and done a really good job for. So again, having that right at the start of the journey as well when someone comes across you that's never met you and uh, because this will be underlined remember with your case studies it'll be underlined with your testimonials it'll be underlined with all the other content you have will be underlined in this business positioning statement so whenever that primary buyer persona you're targeting comes in contact with your business straight away your streets ahead of everybody else because you're talking their language you seem to already understand what they're thinking what their pain points are so they want to talk to you they want to reach out to you or they want to consume your content so they want to watch your videos and download your blog posts and download your guides and your checklists that you're offering them and that really is what it sums up as being a magnet not a megaphone and again kevin's 
approach is still a megaphone approach. You know, we'll go out there, we'll share as many leaflets as we can with people, we'll talk at people, and hopefully some people come back with us and engage with us as a business. The problem with that approach now is it's getting more and more expensive, you know, one for Kevin's time to walk around a did, uh, an industrial estate, giving these leaflets out. It's not trackable or measurable, so you don't know who's, who's read your leaflet and who hasn't, who's come back to you. Um, and who hasn't so it becomes really resource intensive and very expensive to do too and it's very interrupting you're interrupting me doing something else by trying to get your message in front of me and it's why ads aren't working as well it's why everything's going down because we can cut that out far more effectively you know i can i can have filters on my email to cut out sales messages i can do i can cut out nearly every sales message if i really want to so the only way to get my attention is to share relevant valuable content with me and that's what you're doing on the magnet side you're educating your audience you're becoming a teacher you're sharing interesting valuable content and you're helping them make the right decision for them you know remember again with nigel he wanted me to get to having the mini but he didn't want me to um necessarily spend money on extras we didn't need so he went through the process until we got the right price um so engaging and interacting our audience is really important there because if we have poor engagement and interaction with our audience, it is constantly this push mentality. And that just, the only way to get that mentality is to spend more money and spend more of your time doing it. So again, just think in your mind, are we being a magnet attracting people and pulling people in, or are we being a megaphone where we're just talking about us, which is pretty boring. And on social media, people will just unfollow you. If all you do is talk about you. Uh, and I see it on LinkedIn all the time. I don't know if any of you are, on LinkedIn see it when people connect with you and all they do is talk about themselves you know how um, quick a cutoff do you have then you know they, they've blown everything I, I won't be speaking to them in the future whereas if they talk about me they generally engage with some of my posts they'll like and comment on some of my posts and then they connect with me and then we have a conversation about general business then I start talking to them you know we open up and we start engaging so again that's a push mentality being used on social media versus a pull mentality where you're engaging with people and interacting with them. Um, same on Facebook, exactly the same for you, uh, Ollie, with a Facebook audience. You know, if you engage with them and you encourage them to interact with you as a brand rather than just pushing a book, book your next table with us, book your next escape room, book, 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 you know, it just still pretty soon wear thin. Um, so creating valuable content is key to that because we're winning their trust, we're building our authority as a thought leader, you know, we understand the problems you're going through, we can help you. Uh, that mentality is really important. And we're also earning permission, people will accept that you will market to them, you're a business at the end of the day. So there's going to be some stage where there's going to be some sort of conversation. Um, but you're earning that permission, you know, you're sharing value first, you're leading with value rather than leading with a sales message. And that really is where inbound marketing comes in. That's why that inbound approach is very much based around sharing that valuable content um, to drive the right traffic and also the right leads. So that lead generation is very, very focused on that buyer persona. So the definition that HubSpot give of inbound is that it's about attracting customers through relevant, helpful content, adding, every, at, adding value at every stage of the buyer's journey. Potential customers find you through channels such as blogs, search engines, social media, and then we use marketing automation, conversational marketing, chatbots, uh, emails to nurture evolving relationships with those customers until they, uh, with those leads until they become customers. So that's very much that inbound mentality of pulling them in through our environment. And we're only engaging with those people who are expressing an interest. Now that's the power to me. Um, it, with my sales hat on, I think, that person's read three of my blog posts, he's downloaded this guide, he's watched three of my videos, you know, he's, he already knows about us, there's a bit of trust there, a bit of authority, we've shared lots of valuable content. He is not going to mind now if I, I pick up the phone to him and say, I see you're looking at inbound marketing, for instance, you've downloaded our guide to inbound marketing, setting up a campaign, you know, do you need any help with that? You know, and that's a very natural conversation that started. So the methodology that we follow, is very much attract, convert, close and delight. So at each stage, we're turning a stranger into a visitor to the website. So all of our content here is aimed at that pre-awareness stage to pull them in 
to be coming a visitor to our website. So that'll be a blog, that'll be keywords that we've optimized on uh, on social media and on um, Google so that people, when they search for a certain question, a certain query or a keyword phrase, our content pops up in front of them. That then attracts them to the website. They click on the link, they read the content. During that blog post, they'll also be offered a conversion offer. So by the way, if you're enjoying this, download this guide that we've produced for you. So again, that's converting a visitor into a lead. So forms, calls to action and landing pages. So nearly all of our traffic, we're trying to drive to a relevant landing page. We're not trying to drive everybody to our home page, you know, because and then say right now, find your own way around. You know, you'll see everybody who goes to a blog goes to a separate blog post that they're reading. Within that blog, there'll be calls to action. There'll be forms popping up that offer them other bits of valuable content. Again, not to sell to them at this stage. That's really important. You're just adding to that journey. They've expressed an interest in a certain topic. You're now going to expand on that interest, teach and share and educate. Um, and we do that through landing pages, calls to action and forms. They're now a lead in our CRM. So we now need to nurture relationships with that leads and keep that relationship going. Make sure we're front of mind, like I said before. So that can be done through email really effectively. We have automated emails going out, depending on what action they take within an email, it may trigger another workflow. So a lot of this is automated, but we're always lead scoring people as well as they go through the system. So as a lead engages with content, watches videos for a certain period of time, downloads a checklist, downloads a guide, what reads more of our blog posts, they're being given a higher and higher score because they're becoming a more and more good fit lead. At that stage is when we hand them over to the sales team to convert them into a customer. That's now because we've said, right, they've met our criteria as a marketing qualified lead. We now hand it to sales as a sales opportunity. So they're really being given really good leads at every stage. And then they should be turned into customers and then the key thing there is we delight them. Once they're a customer, we delight them. We find those extra little things, Ollie, that you do when they come to your premises to really delight them. So they're out there as a promoter of your business. And that really is where your reviews are generated. That's where case studies can come from. That's where testimonials, you know, and we'd say focus on video testimonials. There's nothing better than someone stood in front of a camera gushing about what they've, their experience with you as a business. You know, and we'd always say use video, don't use written anymore because anybody can write a written review or a testimonial. Um, and we're turning them into a promoter. You know, we're saying now you're a customer of ours, we really value your, you know, your being a customer of ours and make a real thing of them here. Don't think the job finishes once you've turned them into a customer, because to me, that's where the easy revenue is generated. Cross sell, upsells, other services you have is where your extra revenue gets you to those goals. Does that make sense? Who's that, Elena? It's a, it's a long sentence. <laughs> Is that your business positioning? <laughs> I love it. So that's the methodology. And again, we'll send a copy of these slides across to you. I've done, I've saved them all as a PDF. So don't, you know, while you're all making notes um, and you'll go away with things today, um, re-go through the slides. Uh, I'm also, I'm gonna, at the end, I'll share with you uh, a six video masterclass that I've produced uh, or we've done as DME. Um, and this goes through planning out your strategy as well. So a lot of this is recovered in there, but there is a workbook with that, which goes through a lot of this. So again, I'll share all those bits with you so you can go off and uh, do a lot of this yourself on your own businesses. So content, brilliant book I'm gonna to recommend to you all to get is They Ask You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. Um, I've probably read this about 10 times now. It's a fantastic book. And his whole methodology is inbound and why content's the best sales tool in the world. Uh, and it really covers what we've talked about so far in here. It answers people's questions. It builds authority. It shows thought leadership. It really gets that trust element that we can't get by not having face-to-face -face on digital. We have to build our trust in different ways. And that's what content does for you. But he also shows you how content can be used to pre-qualify people. So he, he basically, um, his backstory was he ran a swimming pool company in America. They were selling about $60,000 pools was their average price. Um, and they built up a whole inbound strategy, creating 
every blog post on anything you could want to ask about swimming pools, you know, versus content. So it was this versus this type of pool. So I think it was concrete pools versus fiberglass pools. And he did all this content and then he put metrics on it and measured how, mu how many leads came through each of these pieces of content. But he also got to the stage of knowing that a person had to have consumed so many pieces of content on his website before they bought. And it was something like 85% of people who consumed this figure of content on his website actually bought a pool off him um, and so he broke down everything by yes having great content but also measuring what people were interested in and producing more of that content so he thought people are reading this and like this I'm going to produce more of this and then over a year two years he built this it's an unstoppable resource and he worked out one blog post had brought in three million dollars of business um, one of his blog posts and he'd, he'd got that accurate measuring of where that initial lead engaged with the blog post and all of this and he really goes through every area of using content in your business and then he plans it out over a long term so he says I don't plan it out oh I'll just write a blog post next week he said we're mapping this out over a year um, two years and really what you're trying to do, as I say, I've said at the bottom here, map it out for the next 12 months, channel by channel. So what are you sending out on social media? What are you writing as content that you want to be found in the search engines for? You know, some of that you can pay to be found for before it actually organically ranks for. So a lot of this really is back to understanding your buyer personas, those questions are asking um, and driving a positive action of consuming your content, visiting your website, becoming a lead. That's the really key thing you're always trying to get with your content. So it's got to be valuable. So you've got all sorts of things like newsletters, guest blogging, all sorts of things you can do in the future. But I'd say just get that initial content sorted out and map it out for the next 12 months. And then what channel are you going to share it on? And then set up a posting schedule for yourself on social media. Some of it you can post live. Some of it you can automate some of your posting there's tools out there like Hootsuite uh, HubSpot have all their own social media tools built into them as well for posting on LinkedIn Twitter Facebook uh, so again just map it out some of it has to be live because you want to be seen to be engaging with your audience don't have it all automated and look like a robot um, but map out this long-term content strategy um, and then align it with that buyer's journey so think right we're going to share out some general content here we're going to share out more specific content here we're going to share out some of our testimonials and our case studies down here uh, some of the reviews you left can be shared as well so always focusing on that insights to teach and educate people though so thinking back to the buyer's journey we've got consideration and decision stages um, and in the in the book he, Marcus says there's five things that people and buyers ask the most regularly. The first one is how much is it gonna cost? You know, so he says, if your content isn't addressing that and if your website isn't addressing that, and uh, if you're shy and your competition are talking about pricing, but you're not, he says, you will suffer. Uh, and it's really true. The people who are more transparent online about their pricing and costing, are the people who you want to do business with because you think they've nothing to hide they're very upfront with it you know and i think that the thing i hear from most clients is oh well i don't want my competitors to know what we charge and i think well if i'm a decent business owner i can find out what you charge pretty quickly you know it's a pretty poor poor excuse to not tell everybody else out there who could be a potential customer of yours how much you cost um versus worrying that about your competition because to me that's just negative marketing you're just worried more about your competition than actually doing a good job yourself for your own buyers um talking about problems again problems issues anything that people need to keep into keep in mind um when they're going through their buyer's journey so some of the problem um things are more searched on google than anything um you know i think things like problems with outbound marketing or problems with you know we always type in the problem before we type in the positive i think it's human nature just to search for a problem um so again address some of the problems in your industry that you see some of the problems that customers talk to you about you know you don't have to have it as a negative it can be very much a positive but again i think it's that earning people's trust you're quite willing to talk about the problems uh, versus and comparisons again very very important um 
is maybe an escape room versus something else, um, indoor football or something like that for a birthday party. You know, you can compare the two, think what are the buyers comparing in their minds at the moment when they're in this part of the journey? Because you'll know in a consideration stage, they've got three or four options. So if you can write content comparing two of them, again, it's, uh, it's really valuable content. And it's what people will find valuable and be searching for. Obviously reviews are really important. Um, reviews on everything in your industry everything in your service you know so do reviews on your own service as well and then you can share obviously customers experiences and reviews of your service so um, and then best in class we what's the best of x so again you can write about that or you can write about the top five best um, so again ollie maybe it's the top five experiences for a birthday party in Selby you know things like that so you're talking very specifically to that buyer persona helping them with their consideration stage uh, and again the more we can not position our own business as one the better you know the more we're open and transparent yeah, it may be that you are one of the top so you put yourself in there um, but again you don't want to be seen to be everything always angles towards you I think we all we can all see that pretty pretty clearly when we're reading a, a piece of content. So um, those are the five areas to focus on. Uh, if you're struggling, um, obviously you'll have done a list of questions as well that your buyers are asking. So you should by now have loads of content to write about and then turn some into videos and um, turn some of these into videos to go on YouTube, turn them into videos to go on Facebook, onto Instagram, onto LinkedIn. Um, you know, as you get your blog content built out and you find what your most popular blog posts are. That's how we would do it is we'd run 10 blog posts, find out what the most popular ones are and then turn two or three of those into videos. And then we'll embed the video into that blog post as well. So if someone comes to the blog post, they maybe want to watch the video rather than, than read the blog post. So again, you can have the same topic and subject you're talking about but a variety of different formats you present it in. So it maybe suits a podcast, it may suit a webinar that you're going to run um, or a training workshop like this. You know, maybe you've got a subject that you are passionate about that you think, I just want to get 40 of my primary buyer personas on a webinar that I can talk to them about this. Um, so again, there's various ways to share your content, um, but initially to attract people to the website, I'd say it's video, social media and blog posts that you want to focus on. Everyone happy? What time are we on? Five past 10. Any questions at this stage? Can you just say yes, blog in chat if you use a blog at the moment in any way in your business? On your website, do you have a blog? Do you know what a blog is? Okay. Yeah, I'll give you a tip as well. When you set your, your keywords up, think of all these questions people are asking you. So do the list of questions first, then split it into the different stages of the buyer's journey and then put a keyword phrase next to it. So uh, three, I always think about three, three words in the keyword phrase are easier to rank for in Google. You know, if you start going too tight, then you'll start to struggle to rank because there's so much competition. So go three or four word keyword phrases um, and then put that next to the title of that blog post. So, you know, that's what I'm trying to rank for. And then do a video as well on the same thing. So you can rank that in, in YouTube but that should then allow you to map out your blog content for the next, you know, these are the 25 blog posts I've got to write this year. Uh, it'll just take the pressure off. You won't get as overwhelmed um, and you can just do one every couple of weeks. Um, 800 to 1000 words is the right length for a blog post. Um, you know, don't go too long because otherwise people don't read them. Um, and then you can also, I'll talk a bit later about it, but it's uh, you can turn it into a pillar page, which is a, a long, um, 4,000 word page all about a certain topic, your main core topic for your business. So uh, start with your blog posts first. And then as you get to 10 or 15 blog posts around a, a major topic um, or your core topic that your business is a specialist in, then you can start developing more of your SEO in the future. Uh, but just get those blog posts written because they'll be so 
Google loves them, they'll rank them really quickly. And especially if it's specifically answering a question, um, they seem to rank really well. Take six to eight months. Don't think it will rank tomorrow, but it will. Over time, you'll, you'll rank and you'll see lots of traffic for very specific uh, visitors come through those blog posts. So blogging. So building trust through blogging. Um, uh, and the power of this is regularly publishing new content. Um, so not writing 40 blog posts and then posting them all within a month. It's really spreading this out and posting two or three every month so that you're constantly being see, seen as someone who's answering questions and releasing new content out there. Um, so what to blog about? Again, the subject areas that we'd focus on are those frequently asked questions we've talked about. So don't have an FAQs page, please just answer, answer as blog posts um, and then turn them into videos as well. What does your buyer persona need help with? And again, thinking through your buyer's journey as what's he, what are the buyer personas looking for in that early stage? What do they need help with here? What do they need help with here? So again, writing content around that. Um, industry specific in B2B, I think industry specific blog posts can be very, very uh, effective because there'll be industry news coming out all the time. There'll be things that are happening. Obviously, we've got some major um, international news at the moment with COVID and with uh, all the things happening there. But there'll also be things happening very specific to your industry. And if you follow your industry closely on Twitter, on LinkedIn, you'll be getting lots of news stories come out. So again, you writing a blog post about something that's very relevant can be seen as thought leadership. It can also be shared by other people within the industry. It can be picked up by journalists. So from a PR point of view, um, you can suddenly be getting interviewed by a journalist um, in an industry magazine. Um, so all of these things are really important that you're sort of tapping into blog posts in that that way as well and then what are other industry bloggers social media and competitors talking about so monitor your top five competitors either locally um, around Yorkshire or nationally if you feel you've got national uh, competitors then monitor them what are they talking about what what's their social media posts about um, it'll also fill you with confidence because they'll be pretty crap most of them I'd have thought um, that's what I tend to find when we monitor the competition we think oh, it's a bit boring a bit bland this um, so again just get yourself in that mindset if you're in b2b certainly of the industry but again you know um for Ollie, people who are B2C, think about you know, your sector of the, of the general public. You know, what are they going through? What are the things that are affecting their lives on a daily basis? Um, and don't be afraid to talk about those because that will engage that person, get them coming back through your website and showing interest. So again, use a blog in that way. Don't just use it as a talk about the latest award you've won, which again is what we see a lot of people use their blogs for. Oh, we won this award, rah, rah, us. Um, you know, it's just boring. No one cares. So um, just go for the things that people do care about. And those are the questions that they're asking as they go through their own buyer's journey. And I talked a bit about um, pillar content and topic clusters. Well, the blog content you're writing is very much a topic cluster. So that's all the multiple topics within a main topic. So a pillar page on any website now, this is how Google ranks everything. If you search anything in Google, you'll see that there's always a top answer returned now that's highlighted. And that is what Google regards as the authority on the question you've just asked. So this is the most authoritative piece on the question that's been asked. Um, and what they're returning there is a pillar page because that'll be something that's a long piece of content, maybe has videos embedded in it, maybe has some graphics embedded in it, some images, but it'd be a long piece of content around the, the most relevant to the search you've just done on Google. Um, so what's your core topic that you're the experts in? And you must have in your website somewhere a pillar page. We've got four pillar pages now in our website. We've got one on inbound marketing. We've got one on inbound sales. We've got one on account-based marketing. And we've got one on sales enablement. And they all came from being initially just being blog posts. We'd written a blog post that got longer and longer as we added to it. And then it got to this stage where it was the authoritative thing on inbound marketing. We thought, you know, if you want to know about inbound marketing and you read this page and it's broken up into sub 
into subheadings. And a lot of those subheadings became blog posts of their own that linked back to that pillar page. So we were getting our own internal linking back to that authority page on our site. So think of it like that. Think of your main core topic as your pillar page. This is what we, we want to be known for. This is our core topic, our expertise. And then think of your topic clusters surrounding that, maybe 12, 15, 16 blog posts around it and videos linking back to that page. And that's how to structure your content on your website to get the most effect for it and get Google noticing you and taking, obviously ranking you when people type in um, any questions or searches that you want to be ranked for. Does that make sense? And this last line's important here. Remember that search engines aren't your customers, humans are. So make sure when you write content, it's not just being written to optimize for search engine ranking because Google's too clever for that anyway. So let's just write it and make sure that people who read it get lots of value from it. Right, let's go to social media now and start using social media in the right way to generate these visitors from social through to your website. And the way we approach social media is in four, four different ways. Social selling, which is actually talking about us and trying to sell something. Um, we would say one in eight of our posts would ever have a link to our website or asking people to take action. The rest of our content uh, or the rest of our activity, sorry, on social media is all about social listening. So we're monitoring hashtags, we're monitoring conversations about certain keywords, we're mon monitoring certain customer profiles on social media, um, really to get involved in those conversations and also listen for mentions about us as a company. You know, that inbound mentality on social media is when people talk about DME or talk about Ignite Growth, I want to re be responding quickly. And uh, so they really feel that I care about them talking about me. Uh, so again, that social listening is a huge part of it. I think if people just use social media to listen rather than to talk all the time, they'd find far more business on there and far better engagements. Social influencing, again, is sharing good content, that valuable content you've re been writing, your blog posts, things like that, free content, guides, downloads, all of those things. You know, If you're adding value through social media and sharing it, maybe using live streaming and having one of your questions that you turn into a live stream on Facebook or on LinkedIn that you talk about um, on a daily basis. Again, you're going to have that shared by your followers. You're going to have people connect with you through that. So very important that you do that along with the social listening. And then social networking is tagging people in. It's identifying people who already have your audience, already have that buyer persona you've identified, will also have other interests out there. They'll have other people, other brands, other influencers that they connect with and they're in front of. So again, we would have an active influencer campaign going where we're connecting with those social people and um, networking with them actively, tagging them into posts. We write some of our blog, blog posts and also sharing their posts. So identify those top 10 influencers in your area, in Leeds maybe, or in Selby who regularly talk about um, your industry um, and then tag them into posts or share their posts. And you'll be seen by them after a few times of doing this. I can guarantee you'll be noticed um, and you'll be shared by them. And then what will happen over time is you build up this relationship with people and start chatting to them they'll start sharing your posts as well with their audience. And as long as you've defined your audience clearly and you know who their audience is, you can get this huge effect from social media where you're getting far more reach than you should be. Um, and then social selling, as I say, every now and then people, you've earned their trust, you've shared lots of value on social media, engage with them in the right way. They'll understand if every now and then you promote something of yours, you know, so if you have an event coming up or you have something that you want to invite people to, or you've got something interesting to share with them uh, on your website, then, you know, one in eight, as I say, is a good ratio to have of then you can, you know, uh, certainly have earned, earned the right to promote to them in that stage. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I, I always look on social media. I've said it here as a tip, but I do think I'm trying to get a one-to-many platform to be a one-to-one -one platform. So I'm trying to get into that stage as quickly as I can where I've engaged with someone and then I DM them and I can get in a conversation with them one-to-one -one on a message because that's where your personal uh, connection and 
sharing something really valuable for them personally you know you can talk to them about what they're what they're looking at things like that and then you can say oh this might be really useful for you here you go here's a link to something that I did on, um, on that um, so again that's what I'm trying to you're always trying to do with social media is reduce that one to many where you're broadcasting mentality and you're trying to get to that inbound mentality of right you know now I can connect one to one with people so and then you can once they're on your website you can in, then engage with them getting them on your CRM and things like that so try and look on social media like that rather than just as a I'll talk about us every single day and post about us, you know, use it in that sort of way, monitor hashtags, find out what industry people hashtags that people use. Um, nearly every industry will have shows coming back and events coming back and um, trade shows, things like that, uh, trade magazines that talk about it. So a lot of that can really drive what you do on social media every day. And most clients I speak to, I say, just give yourself an hour every day, either an hour in the morning or an hour in the afternoon, um, where you just focus on social media, engaging with people, talking to them, sharing their posts, looking at what they're posting about, commenting on it, things like that. You'll get a real benefit from that. Um, and there's a book I talk about called Social Selling Mastery there um, by Jamie Shanks. And he talks about how to use LinkedIn and social media to do exactly that, to engage and drive leads just through that engagement. Um, and he has a 90 minute process every morning that he goes through to do this. Oh, there it is, sorry. Uh, our aim is to increase exposure probability. So the chance of our buyer persona seeing us is going up and up by being more active on social media. Viral probability, which is the chance that people will share our content with other people and mind share probability. So again, that's just us staying front of mind, our business staying front of mind in people's minds and busy lives that we have um, by constantly posting on social media and popping up in people's feeds. We just keep our brand, keep our message front of mind. And that's the power of social media, those three areas, exposure, viral and mind share. So now we've got social traffic going back through the website. What are the other areas we can look at for traffic? And um, the three areas that we'd focus on are organic search, which we've talked quite a lot about here. So finding your buyer, uh, sorry, your buyer finding you through search engines with SEO, blog content, pillar pages, videos, um, social media, which will be organic search, so organic traffic through social media, posts, links, um, articles being shared on social media back through your website, and paid ads and paid search. And again, <coughs> sorry about that, let's have a drink of water. Yeah, again, don't be scared of paid ads. Um, I think a lot of clients I, we work with have been burned in the past by agencies who've just gone so broad at Google Ads that they've spent a fortune for hardly any return. I think once you've got a clear idea of the keywords that your buyer persona is searching for, you've got intent keywords as well, you'll be able to identify out of those, you know, I want to appear for people searching this then you can be really targeted with your paid ads and it should give you a positive ROI. Uh, and again, using something like HubSpot, you can track all your ROI through all your paid ads so you can see exactly what leads have been generated for what spend and what revenue it's generated you. So again, make sure you go to that detail on paid and you shouldn't get stung. Um, LinkedIn ads, again, are massive because they're so targeted at people in certain positions in certain companies. So again, if you've identified your ideal customer profile as being in this industry, you can target them. If you know that it's an operations manager you need to be in front of, an FD, it's the owner or the founder of a business you need to be in front of in a certain industry, you can target them. Um, and again, you can also remarket to them. So if it's people who visited your website, you set a pixel up there, build out a custom audience in LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, build out your custom audiences for everybody who's already aware of your brand because they've engaged with your website in some way. For six months after that, you can then remarket to them across uh, social media. And again, just as remarketing, I think if you just ran remarketing ads on LinkedIn, targeting owners and founders of certain size companies if you, all it was was people who you'd already had engaged with either your posts on LinkedIn or had visited your website and you just marketed to that audience you'd have a 25 30 percent increase in your leads so it's just 
being really, really specific with your spend on that and measuring it. I keep going back to measuring, but it's something I cover in detail in one of my workshops and how you set up metrics for every step of this. So there's nothing left to guess with. There shouldn't be anything that you don't know. If I spend X, I get this back, you know, and that's what we're looking to get to with our lead gen. You know, and it really is that easy on digital. Well, not easy. I shouldn't say easy because it isn't easy. But if you can measure everything and the outcome of this spend, then you can optimize it. You know, if you have built a, the right system at the heart of your business, you should be measuring all of this and know that every activity generates X amount of leads and gets this amount of revenue from it. So, again, don't be scared of paid ads, but just be careful with it. Get your organic working first. Once your organic's driving traffic and you can start to get some real data on what keywords and what people are searching to that actually turns into business for you, then you can start investing in paid ads. And really, that's where you scale up and accelerate every month. So as I say, don't be scared of it, but also don't just fall for the old lines from some ad agency that's trying to sell you some Google AdWords. Because um, I had a company who did video and they were... They were, they were doing corporate video and there was an ad agency they were working with who would just kept bragging how much traffic they were getting from the term music video. And I says, music video? I says, but how many customers have you got from music video? And he says, oh, none, but look how much traffic I'm getting. I says, doesn't matter, doesn't matter at all. I says, that's a waste of money. And uh, he was getting loads of traffic from it, but no customers. We set up metrics to measure it and he absolutely got no leads and no customers from it. But all the ad agency kept going on about was how much traffic he was getting from this one keyword. So be very careful on that because it can be just what we call vanity metrics that you're getting loads of traffic, but it's actually conversing into no revenue or business. So again, don't fall into that trap. But those are your areas really for increasing your website traffic, organic search, social media and paid ads. Um, and don't forget remarketing and custom audiences. And then when that traffic's coming through, we need to make sure, I said at the start here, I've put it in here, 2% of that traffic's converting into a lead in our CRM. So that's your, that's your benchmark I'm going to set all of you. Make sure that whatever traffic you're driving through your website is converting at that level. I mean, we've had clients get up to 3 5%. So it is achievable, but you must make sure that you're really careful on where every single person goes to. And as I say, not everyone should go to your homepage. That's lesson number one, is make sure they're going to a relevant landing page for what their search has been, rather than just sending them to your homepage and hoping they find in the navigation what they're looking for. Um, so let's look at how we conversion optimize our website to make sure that traffic is turned into a reliable source of leads for us. Um, and the, the way we always do it is through a conversion or a content offer. Um, now, conversion offers are exactly that. The whole reason of being is to offer value to someone to convert them from a visitor into a lead in our database. So there's no other reason for that offer to be there other than to give them value. So don't just put some generic guide up that you hope is going to hit the mark. Remember, you've done all that research into keywords, you know, the questions people are asking. So build a bloody guide out of it. Build videos out of it. You know, you've got all this content now. You know what the pain points are for these buyers who come to your website. So offer them something valuable here. And often people... And what we've done very successfully with ours is we've turned our pillar pages of six or 4,000 words into a guide because someone might download a guide that wouldn't read all that page because we're not expecting everybody who lands on a pillar page to read 4,000 words. They just don't. But within the first few paragraphs, one of these will pop up. So there's, there's ours here, actually. This slides up from the bottom corner, download the ultimate guide to inbound marketing. So again, we've produced a guide and we've now turning this into videos as well, because we're going to split test whether people want a written guide or they'd rather have videos to watch. So again, you can do this as a video series, you can do it as a checklist, you can do it as an infographic. Um, a PDF guide um, is, is what we find is the easiest to produce first, because really you're just pulling together 12 blog posts and putting it into a guide. Um, so each of the blog posts becomes a chapter in your guide, bang, off you go. That's your guide done, because uh, they should all be around a set topic and then give it a nice, um, a nice title and then offer it to everybody who's reading a relevant blog post. So anyone who's reading a blog post on our website about inbound marketing, this will slide up about inbound marketing. 
obviously if they're, if they're reading about account-based marketing, then our account-based marketing video series comes up or our account-based marketing guide comes up. Um, so again, by having the right system in the back end, as, as we'd use HubSpot for this, we can tell what they're reading and provide a relevant piece of content. Because if they're reading about a subject, they're showing a level of interest. Now that level of interest, it's your job then to offer them more information about what they're reading about. You know, if I'm, I'm reading a blog post on what is inbound marketing, then I need to know some more now. So I'm perfectly positioned now for that guide. So every blog post you have must have a call to action in it and it should be to offer value. It shouldn't be by our service. It should be, by the way, if this is interesting to you, you're probably gonna find this interesting as well. So that's stage one, have a good conversion offer at the start of your, start of your journey that can get people from that visitor into a guide. So you can do this via a form popping up. You can do it via a little this is uh, another website I went on where the screen blacked out and a light box comes up like that to offer the guide. Uh, I like these where they slide up from the bottom left corner because on mobile they're less intrusive. You can shut them down. I think that becomes quite intrusive when you're on mobile trying to find that little cross to tap it with your finger to shut it. Um, so again, think of your user experience of how you deliver these as well and set them on specific landing pages as well. So you'll have a landing page you can send traffic direct from social media to that guide as well so yes one of your calls to action popping up like this can capture someone's data and turn them into a lead but you'll also have a landing page for your guide so every day you can share it through social media or if you're chatting to someone on social media and they're saying oh yeah I'm quite interested in inbound marketing I'll say oh well let's send this guide across I've written and um, you know it's just again helping them so again planning out birthday parties there's loads of things you can write about I'm sure if you think about waste Kevin you know there's loads of things you know about waste that business owners need to know so again just start thinking it through um, and waste the biggest thing for waste I think because uh, we're working with another client in the waste industry as well at the moment is recycling and green it's it's that everyone wants to be green or everyone wants to be socially responsible so you know taking that tone of voice can really help you so uh, you know because people want to buy into that they want to get involved in that sort of advice and you helping them and holding their hand through that is going to be really appreciated so again think this through as I say it's um, only two hours today so I'm just trying to give you some things to think through yourselves. Does that make sense? Anyone offer a guide at the moment? Right, okay, well, think through guide. It may be videos. You might think actually this will fit, fit videos better. Um, it may be that uh, I wouldn't, I'd say webinars are more middle of the funnel. They're not sort of, this is very top of the funnel conversion offer is very much early stages. So you're thinking more of the general questions people are asking to get them involved with you in that. You know, I said, the earlier we can get involved in people's buyer's journey, the, lot, the more chance they have at the end of choosing us. Well, this is one of those key pieces that's right at the start of that buyer's journey. Um, so what would I have downloaded? I'd have downloaded a guide to finding the perfect small car for your family or small car for, for you, you know, so it'd been small car based, it wouldn't have been specific about the type of car. So again, these are the sort of things that uh, you'll find people like Carwow do really well actually on uh, on their channel, um, their YouTube channel. He does specific car brands reviews, but then he does comparisons. So these four cars against each other. Um, so again, he's got a broader title for that than he has for the more specific cars. So again, if you look through your industry, you'll find ways of identifying what are the general questions people ask and then when they get more specific. So I'd say you want another conversion offer for middle of the funnel people, but that'd be more checklists. That's more a, a you know, download our checklist to this and you can tick it off yourself. And um, so again, it's something useful, but it's people who are sort of in that uh, stage where they're coming towards their decision and you're going to help them make the right decision. So that's probably where a webinar and a checklist is more suitable, more middle of the funnel, more consideration stage. This conversion content offer is very much aimed at top of the funnel, getting them in there as a lead, and then you can nurture that relationship. And then we're building out a conversion path. So a conversion path is basically, again, it's something that's very measurable. So you have three or four, point, three or four points that you can measure as a metric. Um, and it's really showing 
how someone's moving through um, through taking actions as you want them to as well. So a conversion app, a simple conversion path that we'd always try and set up would be a landing page with a form on it or a call to action that leads to a landing page. So I talked about having a button pop up in your website uh, or in your blog post that says download our guide, that would be a call to action button. So we'd know so many people have seen that button and this many people clicked it. They then went through to the landing page for the delivery. So we've now gated the offer where they give us their name and email address. So that's a landing page. So we can measure X amount of people click the call to action. That means X amount of people landed on the landing page. And then we need a thank you page to de actually deliver the offer, but also as the third piece of the measurement here to say, that many people landed on the landing page and so many actually went to the thank you page and took advantage of our offer. So hopefully that makes sense to you because it's it'll give you this conversion rate. So it will show you how are you converting traffic um, on a simple level, how are you converting traffic into actual leads in your database? Um, there's another point of having this as well, which means I can set a custom audience up. I talked about them before in paid. I can set a custom audience up for people who went to the landing page URL. So the domain for the landing page will have its own URL, but didn't go to the URL for the thank you page because those people showed an interest, but they didn't fill in the form for some reason. So again, that's a valuable audience for me because as a remarketing audience, that's going to grow quite quickly. And I know something got in the way there. You showed an interest in what I was offering you, but you didn't take advantage of it. You didn't fill your, fill your name and email address in. So I either need to optimize my offer to make it more attractive, more remarkable, so you can't resist it, or something got in the way. Life got in the way, the phone went, you clicked on something else like a squirrel on the internet and disappeared off down another rabbit hole. Um, so again, having that custom audience can be really valuable. You can pick up another 20% of people just by setting that custom audience up because they have expressed an interest. So hopefully you can see how a proper marketer would look at your website here. Uh, every single area of your website is being built into these mini conversion paths, these mini funnels that people go through and you're measuring where the most effective ones are. Uh, and then you build out marketing campaigns at the top of those to feed people into it because you know they're working, you know, we convert at a certain percentage, we're converting 40% of people who go to this landing page into a lead in our, in our, um, in our database. Um, so that's really why you need to really think the next step about your lead generation, not just generating the lead initially, but how do I get them in my CRM and then how do I engage and nurture relationships with them? And I'll just share this on the final slide before we go to Q&A um, about letting the strategy that you're developing dictate your tactics. I, I touched on this at the start and we've gone through a bit of this today. We've gone through business goals. We've gone through our vision, uh, setting marketing and sales goals to support your revenue you're going to generate, values and culture in your business, your visual brand, um, really important. These are all things in your strategy that you need to get right because your brand is going to set you apart how you look how you feel is going to set you apart and i think people people often when they really connect with a brand it is that look and feel that they connect with uh, and then positioning statements i went through that as well so that's your why you've then got your who's which is your target sectors your target markets you're going after analyzing your existing customer base again clv and coca is customer lifetime value and cost of customer acquisition. Now, these are two metrics every one of you needs to get really, really familiar with because customer lifetime value is, yes, a customer may be with you once and spend £4,000, but are they with you three years, five years? How much do they spend with you over the lifetime of their relationship with you as a business? Again, having an idea of that can often tell you how much you can afford to spend to acquire a new customer and that can really change your whole view of your business so cost of customer acquisition and customer lifetime value try and get your head around those metrics and find a way of measuring that uh, your competitive landscape so i've said local competitors around yorkshire but also further afield you know but also people like Ollie aren't necessarily having another escape room as a competitor. It's another thing that someone could do at a weekend. So there could be many ways that people can solve their challenge and their pain or their problem that they're facing. You know, the, the competition isn't necessarily that other, com that other company that does what you do. Um, so think about 
your buyer persona again back to that person the better we understand that buyer persona we also can think through the different options they may have available to them and address those as well defining and segmenting your existing audience is key um because that will help you identify where your best audience is where they are how to get in front of them buying cycles so that buyer's journey how long does your buying cycle take you know for ollie it may be um a mum who goes online finds him books it straight away their buying cycle is really short whereas somebody else in b2b you could have a six month buying cycle so again that really affects your lead generation because you know the revenue isn't going to hit the bank for six months time so when i generate a lead it often takes a lot longer that buying cycle to actually land them as revenue uh, and your buyer personas i've gone through quite a bit because i think it's vital um, and it's talked about a lot at a high level but people don't seem to get the depth that they need to go into with these buyer personas and um, so the deeper you understand your buyer the more you'll position yourself in front of them you'll know exactly where they are on social media what content they're ex uh, consuming regularly what videos you need to produce all of that is driven by that knowledge of the buyer persona and the journey they go on and then your what is your product, your service, your solutions, your pricing, all of these things are driven here. So you can see here why strategy is so important before you ever get to executing it. Once all this is in place, then your tactics, I always think, are fairly straightforward. You should have identified nearly everything, all the content you need to write, all the social media channels, all your marketing and lead gen should have been driven by this. And then when you start executing it, you can really set about building yourself i've said a growth growth software stack so all those pieces of technology you need to be able to measure this and actually scale it up as you grow bigger and bigger um, and also a growth plan and management and reporting so what are those key kpis and metrics we're reporting back on weekly monthly that tell us how quickly we're growing or how slowly we're growing what's working what isn't working um, and a lot of people just give up on things because they're not optimizing um, and that's that's a real it's a tragedy because people often get things nearly right but because they're not getting accurate data back to show them that it's working even if it's slow at the moment you know it's they give up on it and then they jump to the next silver bullet and the next one and that's what you find happens with business growth um, and that's all built around systems you know that's why we're such a big fan of hubspot because it connects all of these dots together all these four things are connected together and um, so all your reporting is central everything's end to end from the middle and i can show from the start of my business growth right to the end of revenue how it's all working so important that you don't just buy the latest piece of software your mates talking about you actually just sit down and think what does my business need you know what do i need to be measuring what's going to show me the revenue going up or down the leads going up or down where they're coming from what sources are generating our leads you know is it the key buyer persona we're in front of and what's working um and that's everything i think the mad the video masterclass i was going to share with you um if any of you use Bitly, I'm sure um, Michelle will send this link across to you as well in the in the follow up with the uh, with the slides and everything else I was going to share with you. If you click on that, it's six videos in which I go through developing your growth strategy. I touch on this um, developing targeted and I go through developing good fit leads and then I go through the whole sales process, how to develop your sales systems and process as well to pull it all together. And I think it's about two and a half hours long of the six videos. But the, the key with it is you get a full workbook to fill in about your own business. So I think it'd be useful for all of you if you just download that workbook and work through the videos and then go through this for your own business. So I'll share that with you again um, in the follow up email. What time are we on quartz? I've done really well today. It's great when you don't have to take questions, isn't it? We can just talk. <laughs> right, so let's take some questions. Anybody got any questions? Come off mute, anybody, if you've got anything you want to ask. To kick things off, Richard, so yeah LinkedIn. i mean one of our one of our big opportunities really well yeah the opportunities really in terms of a channel is linkedin um, okay so we've got a huge opportunity for team building and um, we do kind of bespoke and um, face to face team building when we're allowed to again so we can um the whole session their escape room um yeah. is recorded we've organized kind of bespoke team <laughs> almost like interview sessions so let's say richard you're looking for 
you know, a, a sales manager, you've got six interviewees, we can put those six into an escape room, we can right. tailor the 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 challenge um to exactly what you want. Um yeah. you get to analyze your you know a future sales manager before you you know commit to giving them three months probation. Yeah. Um we then can turn that into a bit of a um a review and analysis. They take the the recording away on a USB stick. Yeah. Um, so it's truly bespoke. I mean nationwide have now opted for a lot of their middle management to actually go through an escape room as part of their interview process as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. you can't you can't rehearse or prescribe. <laughs> Um, so something that kind of bespoke, obviously, uh, it's probably a huge opportunity product-wise for LinkedIn. Now, yeah. you talked about, obviously, the, the paid LinkedIn um, ads. Now, we do a lot of paid um, ads through Facebook and the like. Um, yeah. Are we better off building, I think you mentioned, kind of organically trying to build a bit of a following um, for our page on LinkedIn before we go paid rather than going? Yeah. And I think you definitely need sector specific campaigns for that as well. So if you know nationwide banks, uh, financial institutions are using it, then build out a campaign for those. Really understand who are the key decision makers in the court in those businesses that you speak to, Ollie, yeah. um, because they're the ones you need to be in front of with your content. So, um, yeah, so that's how I would do it. Very much to sort of an account based marketing approach is this is my sector these are all the companies in my sector. It doesn't matter who they work with now, you just say, right, these are the 50 or 60 companies within the sector that I need to be in front of. And within those companies, these are the personas who are usually making up the uh, decision-making group. So yeah. it probably will, you'll have a champion within, within the company who's usually the guy who says, oh, this would be a great idea for us. And then you'll have the finance guy who's saying, oh, I've got to pay for this. What's it going to help us with? You know, then operations will want to know how it's going to improve their efficiency. You know, your owner or the FD or the CEO or the managing director of the business is going to have a more helicopter view of how's it going to really affect the whole team. Um, but I think you need to be in front of that champion first, you know, so you might say, well, it's usually HR. It's usually the HR function within a company. So I need to be in front of the HR managers of all these finance. You see what I mean? That's how I would use it. I'd really build it out sector by sector. I wouldn't try going saying, you know, escape rooms is great for your recruitment. You know, I would say it's great for financial institutions to recruit for this position within your business. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And then you can really be, you know, understanding that what are the pressures, you know, you sp you've spoken to a few people at Nationwide, who would you speak to normally? Would it be a yeah. branch level? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's norm it's normally HR based. So yeah, 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 perfect. Yeah. So that's, that's how I would approach it for you on a, on a LinkedIn campaign. I would, um, I would really build your marketing campaign out very specifically and not use paid initially. Um, but once you start to really get your results in, you'll start to know who you need to be in front of. So then you can roll it out. But you see, you're tied by geographic location as well, aren't you? So, Well, we were, we were until um, COVID came along. So, I mean, pre-COVID, we were all face-to-face -face team building. All the escape rooms were obviously um, yeah. physical. Um, from the first lockdown, we launched our first online escape games. We've now got four and we've got three more being created yeah. at the moment so we've gone we've kind of unplugged geographically for online but obviously the, the the most the most passionate part of our product is is the delivering it face to face where you can truly mm -hmm. kind of uniquely um you know based on customer you know profiles facets and exactly what they want we can build it bespoke yeah. but so yeah we've kind yeah of and that's the power so i would do i'd do a industry specific one and then i would have one aimed at senior management teams so the c-suite in companies because that's where your main team building is going to come and they're all the big bosses that love an excuse to go mess about in an escape room all day so you'll also sell to them easier ollie so i'm sure they won't mind a beer after either so. and a beer after yeah exactly so <laughs> So I think that's uh, that's how I'd do it. I'd have industry specific ones and then something aimed at C-suite because that would, um, you know, that, they they just need an excuse basically to go out and have a day somewhere having fun, don't they? So if you can yeah. if you can really position that well in front of them, um, and what are the key benefits they're going to get from it? Well, obviously the team side, it's that whole what we talked about of having your vision and having your, you know, that whole culture because they'll, you know, what. what be really good from your side is to say look we'll give you videos of it and images as well for you to share on your own social media yeah 
No, that's how I would do it with that. I would, uh, I would get your branding on photographs that you share with them. You send them like a media pack that they can then share out because they're going to all want to, you know, share how, what a great day was and what the benefits were. Um, yeah. I mean, every time we've got a group of players that, that play a room, they get, um, they get the kind of their Kodak moment, but with all our escapologist branding all the way around. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like back in the day of, you know, roller coaster picture, but without looking like you've yeah. been shot in the leg. Yeah, uh, and all the nightclubs used to do it really well, didn't they? They used to have photo booths and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, and all that is, is it's just sharing that experience with everybody else out there, you know, and then they'll be doing a lot of that marketing for you. You know, that thing about delighting people and then giving them the, you know, enabling them to be your marketing arm as well um is really important on the corporate side i'd say it's more important than on the b2c side so no perfect so that yeah i'd split that into two campaigns so because uh, i think they, they need thinking through and planning out quite differently with the copy yeah oh, brilliant perfect okay anyone else thank you, thank you. yeah I'm kevin just... what are you thinking about video you're not going to open up some dodgy channel are you You no, it's, it's, it's an idea an idea i've got a few ideas now have but you good I'll yeah put race with ollie and see if we can get some of our uh staff onto a team building exercise so yeah exactly you, you two hook up and get yeah yeah but yeah and videos on the waste side as i say i think you've got lots of scope there um but just think outside the box with it and think what questions you're asked and you know is there a theme here that i can um i can really hook into um does that make sense yeah yeah you, you need yeah. to generate more digital leads i think that's your your shortcoming you know you know now the restrictions you're under but even when these restrictions are lifted don't fall back into the this is how we used to do it mentality just always be thinking you know what what is the the modern business you know we're all busy people are we really going to read a leaflet now probably not yeah i think i mean what we do is we send the leaflet out and then we have a, like a so sort of when they've landed we'll call within two or three days so it's more of a warm lead however yeah. we are we are a little bit lacking in our uh, inventiveness i think and i think the way i look at it is we're a bit like undertakers and uh, <laughs> we're always going to be in work because everybody's got waste regardless and to be honest we have lost we haven't lost customers. We've put them on. We've suspended them. Yeah. Probably twenty percent. That's yeah. all we've done. So, and we're actually still getting sales coming in through through our website and such like. So, there's still there's always going to be a need for collecting waste. That's one thing where we're quite safe. But yeah. like obviously in hospitality and that, I feel for them. Um, yeah. Because the, 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 but the problem with there always being a need, Kevin, is that businesses get lazy. They stop thinking, yeah, yeah. Think, you know, that's and that's where that's where disruption comes from. And someone coming in your market and disrupts it just grabs a hot kit. Yeah. I mean, so, I have this conversation with my boss all the time about uh, in some respects, we have really, really big customers. Yeah. A, million, a million pounds spend each year on waste, yeah. which is blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got the the holiday let that's one little bin every four weeks. Yeah. So it's kind of waste is you can't. I think we look at it as waste is waste. They they need a bin, but they'll sell yeah. them a bin. But I, I'm trying. I think for me it's more about how can you do it smarter. Is there anything you 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 know like the, you mentioned the recycling and that and the yeah 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 you know that sort of pushing that credential that you know the green credentials are quite important. So um, you know we care for all that sort of thing. Yeah. But I am a pushy. I don't want to be pushy. It's like I'm. I'm. I do go on LinkedIn, but I'm not yeah. prolific on there. I don't. I don't really feel. If you like... can't go on LinkedIn and say, "Do you need a bin?" Can you? Exactly, and that, that's what you know. I mean, we have. If you're not pushy, then you need to just be sharing content that's helping people have the thought process themselves, and then they bounce back yeah. through you. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what you've got to do is just stimulate the conversation, Kevin. Don't think you're trying to sell anything at this yeah, stage. You just get in the conversation, kind of share value with them. You know, you've got a lot of knowledge from your years with the business. And so if you pulled on the other people in the business, you know, there's loads of knowledge there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was, I've been doing this job for, well, not sales, 15 years. So, again, I, I've, I've dealt with customers when I was a driver. Mm. And, you know, you, you kind of get a feel for what 
pay a customer wants. And uh, yeah. when it comes to waste, it is kind of a service. It's more the service that, that they want a regular, reliable service. So that's sort of yeah. what I push for. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, that, again, going back to that, the um, I've just written it down. We, we're going to have to organise some sort of team building uh, mm. event when we can, when, when everything gets back to normal. Because yeah. I, I think we have different departments, and I think sometimes we're all on different page, and that's one problem we could resolve by saying, right, we'll take some drivers, we'll take some managers, and we'll take yeah. some staff. Oh, we'll mix them all up. Yeah, and, and then, then tell that story. Use social media to tell that story as well, you know, because people connect with that. Yeah. And and that goes back to your, that's what they want. They want a friendly service where people just help them. And, you know, that's that's what, if you position yourselves as that, there'll, there'll be amazing loyalty as well. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm not cutting you off, Kevin, but Rachel said that someone yeah. else <laughs> wants to say something. Oh, no, it's Russell said. Who else wants to ask a question? Sorry. Um. I, yeah, I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, Hi, Elena. Um, yeah. For me, I'm, I'm just a startup business. I haven't actually opened my business yet. Um, okay. I will do it in a few weeks' time. Um, I'm opening up a, a pottery painting studio. Um, painting a bit pot. Like, yeah, my background has always been in marketing. I've, I've worked in marketing for 25 years, so I've jumped the fence. So and you've I'm seen it change have, quite a lot in those years then. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to have a go at running my own business, which is which is totally new for me. And as much as... I could spend all day doing this stuff. You know, I could spend all yeah. day mar um, marketing my business, but I have to do the day job. I'm, I'm going to be a one man band. It is just me. So, yeah. you know, throughout the day I'm working. So the challenge yeah. for me is how do I do this with the very limited amount of time that I'm going to have? What would you say is the key priority? You know, if, if, if I could sort of pick any one or two things to really focus in on, because well, I strategy how. definitely strategy and who are you, who's your target audience and how are you going to get generate leads in that target audience yeah well i think at the moment because i've done quite a bit of sort of pre-launch research if you like and testing the market out and it seems to be very much parents with junior school age children um yeah. Initially. So will it be husband or wife it'll be wife it usually then you'd speak it. to when i, think, when I yeah. sort of looked at the the, the data it's, it's it's i don't know it's something like 95 percent women that are engaging with me on social media right so that's it's your low hanging fruit yeah yeah and kids birthday parties and things like that i'm wanting it's not necessarily where i want to be but that's where the market seems to be at the moment you know i'd like to be able to do a lot of um uh you know, at the moment, with people being in lockdown, it's about mild mindfulness and stress busting and pottery painting as a way of relaxing. And, you know, there's, there's, there's probably a bit of a market that's emerging there to, to you know, to and, and older people, believe it or not. I've got a lot of older clients that are, are, are finding pottery painting um, as a new hobby to, to keep them occupied when and, and grandparents that can't see their children and and are buying pottery kits to send to their child to their grandchildren and, and things like that so that it's quite yeah. it, you'd think it would be fairly narrow and niche but it is quite diverse i think the core market no, it's a, is as i say it, it can be diverse as i said earlier i would just pick one of those audiences and really focus on those and i think it's females um i'd say 30 to 45 year olds mm -hmm geographically located around Selby so Selby within 20 miles of Selby yeah because people are not going to travel and, and there are lots of pottery painting studios around so no one's going to travel any great distance it is very very focused on on this location right so you've got a really targeted audience there they'll be on Facebook yeah and you'll probably use Instagram a bit to share some of the paint uh, some of the potteries yeah, Instagram. I've got a Facebook that's all I've done I've not I've not even considered Twitter and LinkedIn. No, um, don't, you don't need to waste time on that. Yeah, I've set up a Pinterest, but that's more about sharing techniques and examples. Because a lot of people will say to me, oh, I can't do that. I'm not artistic. I'm not creative. I wouldn't know where to start. So mm -hmm. that is... is right, so there's, there's, your, fir there's your first question. Uh, where do I start? Right, so get a blog post written on where do you start with pottery painting. And actually, I have lots of like tools that they can use, like stamps and transfers and um, right. sponges so. and things like that. You don't need to be able to, to paint. You can just actually do something fantastic with 
just those sorts of tools. So it's just right. uh, there's so. the tons and tons that's all going around in my head. And there's so much that I can do, and there's so much I want to do. But I think with the limited time I've got, I need to just really, really focus in on something, you know, specific to make best use of the time I have. Maybe an hour on a morning before I go to work, and an hour on on an evening. Right. So, what if I can't paint or I'm not artistic? Right. So, I want you to produce a where do I start video and uh, write a blog post on where do I start? What tools can I use to get started? And what if I can't paint? <laughs> yeah. No, well, that's a problem. That's a problem. There's tools there. You've got three pieces of content there that will generate generate your leads I can guarantee it and do a video for each of them where you sit just in front of a camera even a smartphone and just talk through um, each of those topics share them on Facebook put them up on Instagram so you have to keep them to a certain time on Instagram is it two minutes or one minute might be a minute the video on Instagram but they're buying into you here Elena remember and you're helping mm. them to realize what they're doing so you've got to get your personality across and you be sharing here but then have links through to the website um, and then you need a guide you need to produce some sort of guide that they can download on the website so something simple start with a 10 page guide on pottery painting um, all branded up with your so that's where your efforts got to go you know you know your persona you know who you're aiming at so think of her um, what's her name then let's call her mother mary <laughs> now that that takes me down a whole different persona route mother mary yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's probably a bit old-fashioned name for a 30 to 45 year old now isn't it it's probably, uh, you're giving your 50. age away richard i know i'm 52 i know i'm thinking of mother mary so mother meg <laughs> so mother meg's your, mo your 30 to 45 year old female 20 minutes in selby um her main pain points are, are using this to relax are they is she creative? Is she looking to relax? Is it stress busting, like you said? Is it like meditation and mindfulness? Things. It's keeping the kids entertained, especially at the moment when they're trying to do homeschooling and stuff. There's, yeah. so there's one part of it which is paint at home, and the other part is bring them into the studio. So I think yeah. it's keeping the kids entertained. Is, right, is so you need a piece of content on that as well, don't you? Yeah. So you see, that focus on that. Focus on her and think of her, get this biocentric mentality, not on everything you want to talk to her about, just start, how do I get her involved with me and talking to me first? Mm. Yeah. After that, you can then go into the other areas. I think you just, uh, what you're trying to do is overwhelm yourself um, with too many markets, which is because you've been a marketer for so many years, that's what we think. But the more you can zero in on that one person and how you can help her, then your messaging will become a lot simpler and the content you produce will become simpler and then you build other campaigns out later you know but you know until you're dominating that one and you think i can really you know that's who i'm aiming for yeah that, that'd be my really, advice that's really good advice just sort of focusing on that one yeah because otherwise you'd be going to twitter and linkedin and getting no results you'd be going to pinterest getting no results you know you at the moment you need to get leads in that in your database um so keep your focus on Facebook and Instagram. Facebook for the engagement with people and Instagram for showing the end results. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, Facebook is, Instagram's owned by Facebook. So when you come to doing paid ads in the future, all your data's in one platform as well. So yeah. um, you can probably build, well, no, I won't go into custom audiences yet. Just leave, <laughs> leave it where we are. Keep it simple to start with. Yeah. I mean, I have then, done that with... Um, the paid ads i've done a, a few paid ads um yeah. success i've got to say within within facebook yeah. and looked at you know sort you of can do this organically with video and honestly with video and images you know it's really it's a real image based business yours so no, i'm gonna have to do videos i've shied away from it because i, I just the thought of actually filming myself um, yeah, yeah. Filming with absolute dread it makes me feel sick the thought of does it talk to a camera i mean this is bad enough i know yeah, it's yeah. a lot to do and i've put it off and put it off but i'm just gonna have to bite the bullet and and do yeah it. just have it have it run in the camera and just chat away as if you're chatting to somebody yeah. keep her in mind as if you're chatting to her you know mother meg she's there in front of you what would you say to her 
yeah I suppose it's one of those things isn't it one once you're outside of your comfort zone that becomes your comfort zone so it's just yeah uh, yeah and you, and you, people will engage with you far more through a video than they will through written so I think mm. for this you need to but uh Chat, chatting to mother Meg takes us down a rabbit hole that we none chatting of to mother Meg time, no. so yeah yeah Thanks. I'm just talking of time. I'm very, very conscious that we're uh, yep. three, three minutes. We're coming up to 11, now. not we? So. Um, thank you to everybody for your uh, engagement. Uh, thanks to Richard for his content.